I received a comment on a recent video that I posted that I thought was particularly interesting. In fact, I've decided to post this video in response to it, and further, I will be posting a series of videos in response to it. It's really part of my um, introduction to electronics for beginners. If you're uh, an experienced um, electronics engineer or you've carried out a lot of your own repairs, you probably won't find these videos very interesting. They're really aimed at people getting into electronics, starting to uh, repair equipment, fault find, and um, I'm going to show the various methods that I use, or some of the methods. And I thought I would start by showing the uh, message that was posted. Hopefully the poster won't uh, mind me showing this. Um, but it was quite an interesting series of points that he raised. And um, firstly, he says that I often say when I'm repairing equipment, um, I'll say I found a faulty IC and replaced it. And so I'll be repairing something maybe like this. This is uh, the main board out of a, a pet computer. And um, I'll, I'll find uh, various devices. And I'm really in the video showing the overall process. And I don't often show the details of the fault finding. I've done that a couple of times in the recent videos. In the PDP video, for example, I showed some more detailed fault finding. If that's the sort of thing you want to see more of, then please let me know. And um, what I normally do is say I found the IC and replaced it, but I don't show the process of how I went about locating the fault. And that's really what this series is about. Uh, now, unfortunately, there are really as many methods I use as there are faults that I repair. And the approach I take varies a great deal depending on the nature of the equipment, the nature of the fault, and um, the equipment that I have in the workshop. So the sorts of equipment I will use are anything from um, a multimeter, scopes, I have a logic uh, comparator, um, I see test um, devices, uh, logic analyzers. I've got a Fluke 9010 with various pods that I can use for uh, hooking up to the equipment. And uh, I'll often make up uh, weird and wonderful test jigs. So you've seen some of these before. So these are test jigs that I make as part of a repair process. And um, these have weird and wonderful forms depending on specifically what I'm trying to repair and some of these repairs can get very involved and have sometimes um, resulted in me having to uh, redesign and reproduce some of the major boards within the machine. If you go back and look at my various repairs you'll see um, what I'm talking about uh, but the point is that the approach I take is not uh, always the same. Okay, and so the, the next point in the message was uh, the ICs are mostly on PCBs without sockets, um, which is true, but even if they're in sockets, quite often it's impractical to start um, just pulling the ICs out of sockets and putting them into a tester. As I've said quite a few times in the past, ICs quite often don't just fail, they'll start to degrade in performance. And if you ever look at the signals on a board, for example, like this, you might wonder how it ever worked in the first place. They're not maybe quite as clear and um, well-organized signals as you'd expect. There's a lot of noise and uh, quite often it's just down to the uh, inner workings and the way that the ICs are designed that allow them to function at all. But as they start to degrade, the system performance can start to drop and ultimately the system can stop working entirely. Unfortunately, these sorts of testers quite often won't um, pick that up. They might show the um, device as working. So if all the ICs on the board were in sockets and you remove them, put them into a tester, they might all test fine, even though one of them is actually the uh, culprit and the cause of the system not running. So you've got to be fairly cautious when you're testing, um, especially 7.4 series um, systems. Uh, they are very prone to um, signal integrity problems where the uh, the outputs of one device might be switching uh, but might be too slow or insufficient uh, amplitude to drive the uh, circuit inputs that they're connected to. So um, yes it's easier for a sockets if you suspect a faulty IC it's very easy to swap. Um, 
but we'll come back to that uh, there's another uh, part of his comment that um, I'll come back to in a few minutes as part of this um, and, he, and they said here I assume you have common practice to validate correct function and most uh, variants of the 7400 family and um, yes and no I, I have some very specific ways I go about testing them which I'll show in a few minutes but to be honest um, I never start with uh, any of this I don't start with a multimeter I don't start with a scope um, what I actually start with is the user manual and if I have a user manual if I don't know what the machine is supposed to do how am I supposed to repair it so quite often um, I use the machine itself if it's at all functional and a good example of this was the PDP I used the machine itself to carry out a lot of tests admittedly I had to write some short pieces of code but getting the machine itself to do a lot of the work can save you a lot of time and again something like a Fluke 9010A uh, is very useful for that but uh, the next uh, port of call if it's available are the schematics I spend some time before I ever um, power it up even I'll look through the schematics uh, see what the best approach is to trying to repair something if it's an entire machine I will start looking at the power supply usually disconnect everything first there's no point uh, turning a machine on if the a 5 volt rail is sitting at 20 volts you'll just do a lot of damage so that's the first step I will just uh, do some very basic in visual inspection read the manuals look at the schematics and see if I can pick anything uh, up that way quite often you'll find that just a visual inspection will uh, reveal something um, if it doesn't then we start getting into the more interesting aspects of the repair um, so if, the same here that if the um, device is sold to a board there are several issues and that uh, common testers such as this uh, don't really work if the devices are in a board which is very true you can't really use this with the device in the board even if you make up a connector then this won't work and as it says here um, because everything's on common power rails um, it's kind of impossible for these um, devices to properly test an IC in circuit also quite often you'll find there are various outputs maybe have uh, open collector outputs tied together and they can interact um, so you can't really use this sort of device now that's where something like the logic um, comparator comes in and this is designed specifically to test um, devices while they're in circuit um, but it's really um, comparing a device on the target board with a device that you fit uh, into the comparator so there's a whole uh, range of modules these just plug in and there's one for each different type of uh, IC these the slot in and then you'll compare the performance of a known good device with one that's on the target board and if you get a difference between the two then it will show up on the LEDs on the comparator and you'll know that the device on the board is not working the way it's supposed to so the issues in testing ICs while they're on the board um, you can't really use this sort of uh, device and uh, it's not really the way I go about testing anyway in fact I'm, I quite rarely only use this just to confirm uh, my suspicion that the device I've removed is in fact the faulty device which is one of the reasons I'm careful when I desolder devices even if I suspect they failed um, so the next point is desoldering dozens or hundreds of ICs to validate their function isn't appealing uh, absolutely not and that's absolutely not what I would do um, I don't uh, it's really just called guessing it's not the approach I take um, again if you look at the recent video on the PDP series um, I go through a logical process to see what the circuit is doing in what way it's not working and then I use that to kind of track down and pinpoint uh, exactly where the fault is and then you can start examining the performance of individual ICs which is where something like the logic comparator a scope or the logic analyzer will come in so with the logic comparator you get a separate module for each of the device types uh, that you want to test with the scope you'll use the scope in conjunction with the device datasheet so for example if it's a quad NAND gate 
you can use the scope to see if the inputs and outputs are doing what are expected. Quite often you'll see the inputs are switching but the outputs never change state so it's a fair assumption that either that device is faulty or the one it's connected to is dragging down or up the inputs. So, um, so the final point really is uh, can I share some of uh, my experience with testing in situ devices and that's what this series will be about. This video is just an introduction so I'll be going through the various different methods I use so we'll go through a different type of equipment in each video. We'll use a multimeter if that's all you have it's fine. Uh, we can use the scope, we'll use the logic comparator, IC test uh, devices and then we'll finally move on to things like the Fluke 9010A and the logic analyzer. So before we finish this video, we'll have a quick look at the logic analyzer. I'll show you how I generally use that for this type of testing. Now I would say here that there are two very uh, different types of testing I do with the logic analyzer. I sometimes use it for uh, in situ testing of devices, either logic devices or more complex devices like uh, processors or RAM chips, that sort of thing. Uh, or I will use it to test the overall system and again if you look at the PDP uh, series of videos I used it there to look at the Unibus to check the overall system operation. So I'll just move the camera and uh, show you the logic analyzer and give you some idea as to how I have it set up. So looking at the logic analyzer screen uh, I would say at this point this is not the logic analyzer you normally see me using um, but this is the one I tend to use when I'm doing most repairs and um, the reason for this is because it's got a bigger screen it's easier to set up and um, I don't have to keep reaching across the bench to use it this one has uh, a mouse that I can use to uh, manipulate it and it just makes um, life a lot easier and also I can go to full screen mode when I'm looking at the signals so I can have far more traces on the screen at any one time. Um, but it basically functions the same as the one that I normally show. Uh, but this one has most of the configurations um, set up in it that I use. Now if I'm testing a specific uh, type of equipment I will open a particular uh, configuration and I've these are just ones that are built up over the time I've been using this. Uh, but I have all manner of different setups, everything from uh, a Z80 configuration which will give me, and this will give me a very good way of analysing a, a Z80 system while it's in situ and running. And it's just really uh, a case of setting up the analyzer so that each of the required lines are available on the pods and then you can just uh, connect the pods to a test clip, clip it onto the board and um, use it that way. But for testing 7.4 series if you want to use a logic analyzer you can do that as well. So if we open a specific file and in this case we'll open for example a 7.4.0.4 and we'll look at the way I have this configured. Now I normally configure them in a fairly specific way. I often have a separate um, input available for each of the pins and that is I can look at each one separately um, but I'll also configure them as a bus so I can look at them as a collection of signals rather than necessarily uh, individual signals which might make it a lot easier and the reason you might want to do that for example is for a space on the display if you want to look at more than one at once you can do and um, by having them set as buses you can actually remove all the uh, extra individual pin um, displays and then you can have far more space and if there's a particular bus you want to examine you can just expand it and look at it that way. Um, so just as a, a quick example as to how I'd go about using this if we assume that this um, IC7404 is in a board and that this device um, is the target machine. I'll just set this up to test this particular IC and if I press enter 
it tests it and this IC tests OK. Uh, what we then do is connect up one of the pods. So I have a test clip. Quite often I'll leave these pods connected to test clips. There aren't as many different um, pinout configurations as you might expect because a lot of these 74 series family uh, logic have uh, fairly similar pinouts, although they have different functions, the pinouts are very similar. Um, so what we'll do is this is now clipped onto here. We can arm the analyzer and we can run the test. And what we end up with there is a trace and we can use this to determine if this particular device is working. So it's just a hex inverter, so any time there's a naught, once the test starts of course, uh, any time the input is naught, which is the red trace, the output should be high. And you can see that when the inputs go high, the outputs go low. So this device is working. If this was um, in situ, what you'd be looking for, you'd probably get obviously fairly complex patterns, but what you're looking for is uh, when the two don't do what is expected, that's when the output is not the complement of the input, you'll know you have a faulty device somewhere. So um, the only downside in this is, uh, as I said, if the device is just starting to fail, the threshold might be uh, sufficient to cause the analyzer to switch, and um, so it might be appearing to work on here but um, it may well not be working on the board. This is however still better than removing it from the board and running it standalone in one of these pieces uh, of equipment because it's not loaded like this so it's not going to uh, perform in the same way. The other thing that's uh, a bit of a downside in using these compared to uh, target machines, it's very slow so if we look at the test duration um, We'll just change the display and you can see here the test is taking 114 microseconds in other words very slow testing and um, if the device is starting to degrade this test may not show up that uh, particular issue you also have another issue in terms of the logic levels on this analyzer if we want to we can change the um, threshold levels so if we come in here we can uh, select from different levels or we can even use a uh, user defined level so we can change the threshold if we suspect a device is starting to fail and quite often what I will do is I will change this to a lower value and check so I might go to 1.2 volts for example and then I might go up to maybe 1.7 volts and rerun the test and make sure that I'm still getting the uh, correct values Okay, so that's a very quick introduction to this series of videos. It will uh, extend for a while. I'll just post one of these videos every so often as and when I'm repairing equipment. I'll go through the various methods that I'm using. And as I say, it does vary a huge amount. I've barely scratched the surface here of the methods I use. Um, for example, if I'm working on valve equipment, I use very different sorts of equipment and methods. And if I'm working on surface mount equipment, uh, or more complex devices, um, mostly for development work, then I will again use completely different equipment. What I'm going to try and focus on here is um, vintage electronics uh, equipment, um, such as um, vintage computers, uh, arcade uh, equipment, that sort of thing. And uh, if there's anything in particular you want me to cover, then please leave a comment. Um, but hopefully this will help to explain some of the methods I use when I say that I found a faulty device and replaced it, um, I will have used one of these methods.